Welcome to For Your Amusement, a theme park podcast that aims to exhaustively evaluate the world's most popular theme park attractions to determine if they are world class. I'm Ryan Bergara. I'm Byron Marin. And for this episode's featured attraction, we acquaint you with some important safety information as we discuss soaring over California at Disney California Adventure in Anaheim, California, and Epcot in Orlando, Florida. Also, this ride is in Tokyo and Shanghai but that's only the uh, the soaring over the world version. I believe they only bring back soaring over California to, you know, California Adventure. I think they bring it back to Epcot too. They did this year. Yeah, yeah. for they food did and wine, it right? In like late September of 2023. So this is technically the first defunct attraction we've ever covered. Yeah, in or at least semi semi defunct because it does have the potential of returning, or at least returns on a, a seasonal basis. Yeah, at least in California. Which is why we, you know, we could have brought in our, our buddy Defunct Land for this one, but we'll save him for an actual defunct attraction when he comes back on the pod. Hopefully, uh, please come back on the pod. We need you. <laughs> Anyways, uh, this is a semi-defunct attraction. I am of the mind, and you know, whatever you could come at me. I, I think this is the far superior version. I, I know most park heads agree with that. I wonder how the general public feels about this versus Soren over the world. Just because like I imagine like a general audience would like a newer film and, you know, perhaps enjoys the novelty of going around the world. However, Soren over California, for most park heads, it hits a nostalgic place. It's one of the only good rides at California Adventure when California Adventure opened. And I don't know, it just it just brings me back to a time and place better than Honestly, most rides at Disneyland Resort, which is kind of incredible. I love this fucking ride. It's it's, it's truly a magical experience. I was going to withhold that opinion until later. However, since, since, since you got me on the spot here, I will say that the original version uh, has a certain magic yeah. that not many modern Disney attractions are able to emulate. Yeah that I don't think the new version quite captures. Do you think that's just caked in nostalgia though? And that's like- No, I think I think there's just some sort of, there's an intimate feeling that comes with uh, Soaring Over California. I see. So you get to spend more time in the details. And less uh, like, oh, there's the, it's like, where's Waldo of locations? Like there's the Taj Mahal. Yeah, it, it and, just like, it, yeah, it's just like low hanging fruit. It feels like with the world version, whereas I mean, like, the well, California just... version featured- locations that i still haven't been to today i mean not that i've been to all the world locations but to have all these locations that are like in our backyard essentially that's a good point i i guess like because the soaring around the world version is nothing but banger locations technically it does kind of feel like let me guess where this is and i'm more caught up in that than actually being in the moment whereas the soaring over california yeah there's somewhat famous locations but really you're just taking in the environment rather than you know trying to figure out do i know my geography <laughs> which yeah. is, we'll get into that maybe a little bit more later but you know good to address that up top but for now why don't we get into some history june 5th 1972 the magic kingdom at the newly opened walt disney world resort introduces if you had wings which was a slow omni mover dark ride sponsored by eastern airlines which essentially took guests through show scenes that featured rear screen projections of various travel destinations the attraction also featured a one-of-a-kind mirror room scene which gave guests the sensation of soren over mountaintops how did that work i just kept digging for videos and it's just there's not like really low light back in the day so all the only description i could get is a mirror room so i guess it featured two projectors and i guess they use mirrors to make it seem bigger than what it is oh i see i mean that's the impression i'm getting if anyone out there actually can dig up some footage <laughs> that you could actually like see because like i've looked at povs and it's just like pitch black yeah has anybody who listens to this podcast um, been on if you had wings which sounds like a sarah mclaughlin song <laughs> like it's the goofy ass title i guess i get it because like you know if you had wings you could go everywhere i suppose basically it was a commercial for eastern airlines in yeah. a way but over the years this ride would go through multiple name changes but the theme of the ride remained the same flight and the destinations you can enjoy via whatever airline such as delta was willing to sponsor the ride the different names it received over the years were if you could fly which was after eastern air dropped their sponsorship yeah then delta dream flight which is after delta picked up the sponsorship and then simply take flight which was after Delta dropped their sponsorship. This attraction would close permanently in January of 1998 and be swiftly reskinned to the Buzz Lightyear Space Ranger spin attraction that still runs at the Magic Kingdom today. Oh, wow. 
But prior to Buzz taking over at the Magic Kingdom, interesting developments were taking place during the 90s in regards to bringing another flight-inspired attraction, a spiritual successor, if you will, to life at another Disney park. On November 11th of 1993, Disney, led by Michael Eisner at the time, formally announced an effort to bring an American history-inspired theme park to a plot of land near Haymarket, Virginia. One of the lands to be featured in this park was called Victory Field, which would have been themed to a World War II airfield and featured an aviation-inspired simulator attraction. However, due to strong pushback in regards to the location of the land, in addition to Michael Eisner's health at the time and the tragic loss of company president Frank Wells in 1994, Disney cancels further development of the Virginia Park. As a result, Disney Imagineering shifts their focus to California's second gate, which would become Disney's California Adventure. In 1996, they brought ideas for an aviation-inspired attraction back into the fold for the development of California Adventure. The ride was envisioned to hang riders via cables horizontally into a massive Omnimax screen to simulate flight. When you say hang riders, do you mean like people in a fucking harness you know those like racks that are dry cleaners that move clothes up oh yeah yeah it's something like that i'd like to be like a hanger on one of those bad boys just <laughs> go for a little ride like the door coaster in monsters inc essentially if the, the door coaster that never was that is and this ride concept uh, never was as well because they hit a significant roadblock as the ride system they were conceptualizing would require multiple floors to load the amount of passengers they wanted which was out of the question due to their limitations of budget and the extensive construction required to pull that off and this is uh early stages of california adventure which they were working with no money because of the failure of disneyland paris correct my yes it was, i think it was california adventure was built for like around 600 million dollars which is almost half the price of what their 2007 renovations were of it's $1. also 200 billion. million dollars less than rise of the resistance <laughs> That's for that's or 200, 200 million dollars more rather. So under the budgetary constraints that they had for California Adventure, the Imagineers had to get very creative with finding a solution for this ride system. And the solution is found over a Thanksgiving weekend by Imagineer Mark Sumner, who pulled an erector set out of his attic and was able to use string to crank all three rows of ride vehicles up into what would be a massive concave screen. I've heard this story so many times. I'm sure any parkhead has. Anytime Disney has any promotional materials about the park in general, not even just about this ride, they talk about this man and his erector set. I'm sure his family at the time over this Thanksgiving holiday felt rather slighted. Was he doing this during Thanksgiving or was it just over the weekend? Like if he left the Thanksgiving table to be like, hang on a second, and he just puts his fork down. For all I know, <laughs> Mrs. Sumner burnt the uh, burnt the turkey and he's just like, I, 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 I can't eat this. And he just walked upstairs. Like he's <laughs> mid eating the, the mashed potatoes. Like you pass the yet. <laughs> Eureka. <laughs> drops his fork goes upstairs look i think mom where's my erector if he's anything like me he thinks turkey on thanksgiving is very overrated and had better things on his mind fun fact about thanksgiving is it mm. sucks ass so the result of this is the imagineers getting a green light on what was named at the time ultra flight that was the working title for the attraction while construction on california adventure takes place Film crews spend multiple years getting special flyover permits in order to shoot aerial footage on IMAX cameras for the ride, which they shot at 48 frames a second mm -hmm. in order to make it basically a smooth flying experience. That's two times the normal that you would see in a movie theater, which is 24 frames per second, just yeah. for all you folks out there that aren't cinema heads. So anyways, everything comes together in time for Soren over California, the attraction we are covering today, to open with Disney's California Adventure on February 8th, officially 2001. Although the park as a whole was met with harsh criticism in its opening years, Soren over California was the unanimous exception among park guests. Meanwhile, on the other side of the country, Epcot was in need of a new attraction to improve its land pavilion. Their contract with Nestle at the time was expired and they feared that Nestle would not renew. So they wanted to bring something fresh, something new that could draw guests and foot traffic back into the land pavilion. Reese's. <laughs> 
Oh, Nestle products. That would have been a cheaper option. Um, Re- that makes no Reese's is definitely higher tier than Nestle. No, they have to be. I don't know, but they're also owned product. by they're also owned by Hershey, and there's Hershey Park up in uh, Pennsylvania. So, ooh, I didn't realize candy cup. bars were big in the theme park game. That's oh yeah, a that's little, right. Uh, a little tease for maybe some uh, some rides to come in the future. That is Hershey true. Park, Pennsylvania, pretty fun place. I uh, got to enjoy it over the summer. Well, I'm sure you did. What were the other opening day attractions at California Adventure? Oh gosh, opening day Grizzly. So you got Grizzly River Run. You, you got had that, you got that shitty Golden Zephyr ride. Golden Zephyr, which somehow is still you know spinning guests around in the world of mediocrity. Was screaming there? California Screaming was an opening day park attraction. Wow. Goofy Sky School uh, was, was actually Mahalan called Madness. was called Mahalan yeah. Madness. There's Jumping Jellyfish. There was Malaboomer, which was that oh, SNS. Oh, I remember that one. The, the that the SNS launcher. launched uh, free fall type ride and then a uh, superstar superstar limo. limo which is now monsters inc was there orange stinger which is now um silly symphony swings oh yeah i remember that the big orange i actually like the orange i didn't mind the orange well we'll get back to this one we'll get back to epcot over in florida so their solution for the land pavilion was to build a version of Soren California over there. They construct the 60,000 square foot show building behind the pavilion and connect the two buildings via long hallways, which would become the queue. The entrance of the ride, however, would take place on the bottom floor of the land pavilion, replacing the show entitled Food Rocks. You guys have been unplugged. Simply titled Soren, the cloned attraction would open on May 5th of 2005 at Epcot and would quickly become one of the most popular rides at the Walt Disney World Resort. I kind of wish they would have never done that, honestly. We've talked about this on this pod before. There's nothing wrong with a juicy exclusi for a park. You don't need to have the same rides at every park. Food rocks. I highly ac- encourage people to go <laughs> check out footage of this this wacky ass ride. It's it's demented. Now put your hands together for the utensils. When you cook it with us, there's so much you can do. You can bake, you can fry, you can roast, you can stew. Now on January 4th of 2016 at Epcot and June 15th of 2016. At California Adventure, they closed down Soaring Over California, and within days, they replaced it with a new film reel that covers it, Soaring Over the World, which we're not going to cover today. Ooh. However, it not did to the happen. Fact that we're not covering it, the fact that they did this. But Soaring Over California still makes a brief season return at California Adventure, and it did the same at Epcot, as we just discussed, during the fall of this year in 2023. It seems like they're tying the return of this beloved attraction to the Food and Wine Festival, which is highly catered towards Magic Key slash, you know, AKA annual pass holders, which I think it's just so evil. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> they, they, they want to like bust open that jar of member berries. And... Yeah, they know that these that folks like us will go <laughs> and pay for their food and wine festival offerings just so we could get on Soaring Over California. They're they're toying with their nostalgia. Does anyone like Soaring Over the World? Could someone like comment on this on this video or tweet at me if you're listening to this? Do you like Soaring Over the World? I don't think Soaring Over the World is bad. I don't think it's bad. It's just I think not it's as, worth covering on this show. It's just not as good. It's a tall order to surpass it's cer- it certainly something is. as unique and beautiful as what Soarin' Over California was. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. I don't get it. Anyways, we're gonna. I'm gonna stop whining, and then we'll move to some. Is that is that it for the history package? That's it for the history package. Oh, nice, thank God. Which means we get to take it over to some fun facts. But before we do that, let's take a break to thank our sponsors. Today's show is brought to you by Microdose Gummies. You've probably heard increasing discussion about microdosing. People of all are microdosing THC for a bunch of reasons. We at FYA love these gummies. For me, it really helps to get in the right mindset for relaxing, kind of burns off all that stress and eases me into a good mood like a nice warm bath. Oh, these would pair quite nicely with a warm bath. I'm going to try that. But folks use it for all sorts of reasons, relieving pain or anxiety, boosting your mood, spicing up the love life a little bit, maybe kickstarting your creativity. The list just doesn't end. All I'm saying is that there's a ton of benefits. And if you're interested in finding out how microdose gummies can work for you, here's how to learn more about microdosing THC. Go to microdose.com and use code F. Y A to get free shipping and 30% off your first order. Again, that's microdose.com code F Y A 
microdose.com, code FYA for 30% off. All right, let's move on to these fun facts. The ride is four minutes and 51 seconds long. It feels longer in a good way. It has an operational capacity of 1,879 people per hour and a theoretical capacity of 2,088 people per hour. I guess it's because there's obviously going to be some mix between the operations when they're not you know, going at full uh, scale. So the theoretical is like if everyone was like really clipping, they would get 2,088 people through here per hour. It has an estimated cost of 100 to $125 million. That can't be true. 100 to $125 million doesn't make a lot of sense to me just because the park itself cost only $600 million. That means a sixth of the park's opening day budget was spent on this ride, which I guess isn't crazy. I don't know what they went through in order to get the photography done on this oh, ride I have as some, well. I have some fun facts Because it took, that. I think the filming itself, I don't think was as strenuous, although I think they had to like land the plane every 45 minutes or so. Yeah. And I've heard that the Los Angeles- Or helicopter, helicopter. Helicopter, sorry. They had to land the helicopter every 45 minutes because that's just the amount of, I think, film. That, yeah, that makes like, sense. Like lasted at the time. And then on, on top of that, I actually hear that the Los Angeles flyover scene was test footage. Yeah. And they weren't able to actually, they ran out of time or something like that where they actually weren't able to do the proper flyover scene and they actually had to change like the frame rate or something like that. I guess that footage looks a little wonky. I'm just more thinking about like the logistics of having an IMAX camera in a fucking helicopter. I don't know if you've seen a reel of IMAX film. It's enormous. It's bonkers, yeah. Uh, and I imagine the mags for this bad boy are huge. Like, that camera is unruly. So just that in the tight confines of a helicopter, having that hanging yeah. out of a, a, the side of a, an open door in the air, sounds insane. But no, I can't imagine that took that many millions out of their budget. No, um, no. I mean, it is a, a big show building. It is a new ride system. For sure. So I'm sure a lot of money went into that development. All that's to say, we don't know how much it cost. This is a number we found online. These are fun facts. That means I, I had fun while researching them, and uh, I don't know if I could verify their authenticity for the most part. But I will say, like I'm saying now, if I'm not sure about one, I will I will point it out. The screen is an 80-foot-tall dome with IMAX projections shot at 48 frames per second, like Byron mentioned. Uh, row one of there's three rows on this on this ride vehicle, uh, as Byron mentioned in his history, it is based off an erector set, which if you're familiar with that lifts three rows of things up in such a way where they kind of hang over each other. Row one lifts riders the highest, which is at 50 feet off the ground. Row two comes in at 40 feet and row three comes in at 30 feet. It's said that the best row to sit in is row two in hangar entrance B, because that will put you uh, center of the screen horizontally and vertically. And Imagineers actually designed the film from the center seat of row B2. So if you're, you know, you're wanting the best experience, go for that one. Do you agree with that? I do because the other rows cut off your view of the screen. If you are if you're on the top row, you know you're highest, but then you could still see kind of the ceiling. Yeah. And obviously, you want to be center cut. And yeah, exactly. And if you're at the bottom row, you see the bottom of the screen. Of course, if you're in row two, you get some feet dangled in front of you. But for some people, yeah, that, that's that a, is the benefit of row one. But know. in row two, you do see those feet, which is for me a, a minus. But for some people, I imagine that's a pro for all the Quentin Tarantinos out there. You know what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> I think I'm still row one. Get some get some feetsies. I think I'm still row one because I like to go higher. I like to go wee. Yeah, but then you see the ceiling. I just like, I actually kind of like seeing the feet in view now that I think about it because it makes it feel like we're all on this together. It reminds me that this is a communal experience. I'm not saying I like it because I like looking at people's feet. That's not my deal. The attraction takes up nearly 60,000 square feet of space in Epcot, which at the time, I'm not sure if it still is, that was the biggest sound stage or the, the biggest show building, rather, in the entirety of Epcot. Um, I can only imagine that was broken by Cosmic Rewind. Oh, no, it has that to be. That show building is freaking massive. The thing is enormous. The track is 1 million pounds of steel, the track that the Erector Sec uh, runs across, and the ride vehicle can lift 37 tons, inclusive, obviously, of the up to 87 guests per ride vehicle, which is a good thing to know when you're being dangled 50 feet in the air. You want to know that it's rated for uh, all the churros that are being consumed. Each seat also has a meshed canvas, which allows wind to pass through, which then simulates the sensation of flying. The attraction flies over the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, Redwood Creek, Napa Valley, Monterey, Lake Tahoe, Yosemite National Park, the PGA West Golf Course on La Quinta, credited as Palm Springs, Camarillo, Anzo Borrego Desert State Park, San Diego, which is, it's, that's the air carrier scene, Malibu, Los Angeles, and of course, Disneyland. There's actually a hidden Mickey on this ride. It comes when the golf ball is hit towards the camera. 
there's a little Mickey logo on the bottom of the ball, so just make sure you watch the rotation of that bad boy as it comes towards your face. And guess who's the guy hitting the ball? Why? That's none other than former Disney CEO Michael D. Eisner. Which, by the way, his middle name, D., it's spelled D-A-M-M-A-N. Is this guy's middle name really Daman? Is his name Michael Daman Eisner? Eisner? He had to have changed his name legally to that. Knowing this guy, I could totally buy that he changed his middle name to Daman. Just so when everyone says his full name, they have to say Michael Daman Eisner. You know, by the way, I've, I think I've, could actually, be I've actually been on that golf course. You have? Yeah. I'm sure you really made a real mess of it. No, I didn't make a mess of it. I made a mess of myself. This was like the night after prom night. I was. Oh shit! We had wandered on there in the middle. Basically, the morning after. Oh, so prom you didn't. Night, you didn't play. No, I can't play golf for shit. I <laughs> definitely didn't play in, in high school. Yeah, I was um, imagining that being. A yeah, disaster. the morning. The morning after prom night, I got like text from like one of my friends, like, "Hey, like my grandparents have a place out in like Palm Springs. We want to go spend the weekend there. They're not around. And they want me to like house sit. You know, one beverage turned to a few, and we actually wandered out on that golf course. Do you mean to tell me? That you consumed alcohol under the age of twenty one. I got a weird sensation off all that caffeine from all the uh, all the I'm pop, sh- all the pop I was. Drinking. I'm sure you did lots of pop. I wound up in a sand bunker that a evening. So every ruin. time I fly over that Palm Springs uh, or La Quinta <laughs> scene, I see that b- golf ball hit toward me. I'm like, I was I was down there doing snow angels in a sand pit at two in the morning. That's incredible. I'm sure the the folks that came to play golf later that morning were pissed. I can't imagine that golf course is cheap. That thing is. Beautiful. Oh, it's super expensive. Those Palm Springs golf courses are incredibly tough too because they're lined by houses and i've played on one of them once i'm a bad golfer and all i could think of is like how many windows am i gonna break today i'm sure the people that live in those houses can afford the repairs honestly yeah, well you you're charged you're charged for it if you do it no if way. they catch you you have to pay for the window yeah. and that made me even more stiff we don't have to talk too much about golf but mm-hmm. I, i'm i'm off it for now it pisses me off too much i just i can't handle the stress it just it just stresses me out. I just embrace how much I suck now. I just, I rarely play. So I can't, can't do that anymore. We can we can suck together. Maybe. Well, I, I rephrased that, but you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's fitting today that we're talking about Soren because Green Chef can take you all over the world using only your taste buds. Green Chef, the number one meal kit for eating clean, is here to put the adventure back in your busy life. Each week, choose from eighty plus flavor packed options. Easily customize your meals to suit your lifestyle with preferences like keto, vegan, vegetarian, fast and fit, Mediterranean, gluten-free, and protein-packed. And Green Chef knows that great recipes start with great ingredients. Green Chef only includes unique, farm-fresh ingredients, organic whole fruits and veggies, and premium proteins. So you know that you're eating well and eating clean. What I love about Green Chef is the menu changes so often. Because they're choosing from in-season ingredients, the recipes you're getting will reflect the season as well. Eating clean is not just about eating light. Green Chef offers real, wholesome foods that don't just fill you up, but also support a healthy lifestyle. It's more than just satisfying hunger, it's about feeling good with every bite. It's time to stop grabbing and eating whatever and start eating the way you know you should be. Go to greenchef.com 60FYA and use code 60FYA to get 60% off plus 20% off your next two months. That's greenchef.com 60FYA and use code 60FYA to get 60% off plus 20% off your next two months. Meow, back to the show. Anyways, uh, hey, that's Michael Eisner. Michael Demand Eisner. Nice stroke, Mikey. Uh, though hilariously, this is also one of the few instances of CGI used in the entire... <laughs> so maybe nice stroke? It also seems very Eisner for him to CGI his swing. Yeah, can you imagine Michael Eisner take one, just drill in the helicopter? I gotta say, IMAX. though, that stroke, it looks good. Like, it's a good-looking stroke. There's also another hidden Mickey during the fireworks scene. This one's a, a little more obvious. It's pretty much center screen with the two circles. Patrick Warburton, I did not know this before doing the research, was not the first choice for this pre-show. Right, well. Do you know who the first choice was who was supposed to originally do the pre-show script? You'll never guess it. I was thrilled by seeing who it was. 
Is it like an A-list actor? Oh yeah, can it couldn't have been David Spade, right? Or David Spade was your A-list actor? No, not actor like, well, at that the time. Well, it's got to be David he was, Spade. He was Cusco at uh, he, he was Cusco at the time. I'm just thinking of other. Oh, I see. You're just going straight from the Emperor's New Groove cast. I see that. Uh, no, was it, it w- someone that was like also involved in like Disney films at the no, time? No, that's or? why it's so odd. I'm just going to give it to you. It was none other than A-list actor John Travolta. And here's Imagineer Jim Clark on why it did not work out with John Travolta. <laughs> Quote. Two months before DCA opened, we still hadn't shot the pre-show. John Travolta was interested, but his movie schedule was making it difficult. Plus, he had this little beard. (laughs) 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 I just think it's funny that they're like, yeah, he's perfect for the role, though. What's going on with that facial hair? He's got that little funny beard. With with his beard, he gave us the gift of Patrick Warburton. No, he gave us the gift of Adele Dazeem. Which is still one of the funniest clips I've ever seen. Adele did what? That's what he called Adina Menzel. Oh my gosh, that's right. He called Adina Menzel. Oh Adele man, Dizim. that was that was with a lot of confidence. I have to give him credit for that. Please welcome the wickedly talented one and only Adele Dazim. I wish I could have seen him butcher these lines. Jim Clark goes on to say, "Quote: Our little team was invited to a screening of Emperor's New Groove, and we were all laughing at Kronk." Oh yeah. It's all coming together. The flight attendant was originally just going to give a very simple safety spiel, but the role was expanded a bit after Warburton was cast. End quote. Patrick Warburton delivers, in my opinion, and we'll get into this in the good, I think it's the best on-ride video performance of all time. Now, did you see Emperor's New Groove before experiencing Soarin' Over California? I don't know. Because I will say this, when I first saw the 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 pre-show i don't think i had i just remember thinking who's that guy with that silky voice because i had never watched seinfeld either and so i know he's a he has roles in seinfeld i just remember thinking i fucking love this guy and his voice best ride performance of all time congratulations uh patrick you don't listen to this podcast but if you do just know we salute you and we value your work and your contributions to theme park history next fun fact the original and best version of the soundtrack This is another crazy one. The original and best version of the soundtrack was written by the Academy Award winning legendary composer Jerry Goldsmith, who composed some of my favorite film scores, including 1999's The Mummy, starring Brendan Fraser, Rambo First Blood, Gremlins, Alien, Chinatown, and The Omen, just to name a few. I'm curious if you know this, Byron, because I did not know this. This is a little insight on how Jerry Goldsmith got the composing role. According to Jerry Goldsmith, Imagineers brought in the famous composer for a trial ride-through on the attraction with only the film and the vehicles and obviously no score yet. He emerged from his seat in tears. Fearing the worst, Goldsmith assuaged their concerns, apparently saying, quote, everything is fine. It turns out that those were tears of joy. Goldsmith explained that he had two loves in his entire life, music and flying. And some of his greatest memories came from flying gliders with his dad over the dunes where LAX was eventually constructed. Goldsmith then reportedly said to Imagineers, quote, I'd do anything to be part of this project. I'd even score the film for free, end quote. He was paid. That's the next fun fact. Uh, and that's fun <laughs> that's, for everybody. That's that's astounding. I, I, I did not know any of that. I thought that they just hired him. They're like, hey, we're doing this ride. Can you make a little score? And then he just happened to just slide out a goddamn classic. But it turns out they recruited him and uh, were hopeful that he would like the ride footage. And he was, you know, drawn to tears by it. Which I is, can't believe he offered which is to do wild, for free. Just off the ride footage, because I think if this ride does evoke plenty of emotion but so much of that is because of the score and, you, and so to and, watch it dry like that oh i know he watched it dry and he made it wet and but he's probably like <laughs> he composing in his wet, head like, or at least yeah it's the fact that he was moved to tears by just the raw footage and because he loved flying so much that's why the score is so emotional he put all of his memories and his love for film and music and flying into this score so much so that he would, you know, do it for free. I'd be a sponsor for Chipotle for free. I'd hawk burritos happily. Of course, I'd want Chipotle for life. You'd be in a pre-show for free, too. Let's be real. I would be in a pre-show for free for sure. Disney, you don't even have to write me a check. I'll pay you just for me to be able to be one of the dudes in the front. Like, let's say it's like a disaster. Right? Like, I don't know what's going on. There's shit flying. I wouldn't say shit flying everywhere. Maybe they'd have to bleep me. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I'd be one of those guys that's looking to camera with shaky footage. It'd be goofy, but I'd love to do it. Well, like I said, if I'm ever in an on-ride video, I'm bringing every bit of my uh, very limited talent to do 
the best job that I could. The hangar portion of the queue at California Adventure features a Wings of Fame exhibit that commemorates planes and pilots throughout history, and the Epcot queue itself was designed to have the vibe of a modern minimalist airport terminal, which they nailed it. More on that later. <laughs> uh, the Humphreys service and supply shop across from Soren in California Adventure is an homage to Humphrey the Bear, who starred in seven early Disney films. That's a good boy, Humphrey. Uh, not too much of a surprise here, but the fishermen, surfers, the snowboarder scenes, those were all shot with planted actors, or stunt performers rather, and the performers would have to wait hours for the perfect shot. In fact, those mountain climbers in the Yosemite scene they were hanging from that mountain for six hours just waiting for this shot to happen. <laughs> it's fucking crazy. Uh, airspace over Yosemite, speaking of Yosemite, was protected. So it took several months to secure permission to film there, and the recording was the first helicopter flight over Yosemite since the mid-1900s. Other locations, such as Monterey or Point Lobos, took a full year to secure as those areas are considered marine sanctuaries, and filming could have disturbed the native wildlife. In fact, in the film, you could see a boat from the National Oceanic and Atmosphere Administration, and uh, that is actually monitoring the animal and bird activity while filming, just to maintain the sanctity of this area. So they had to go through a lot of hoops, lots of red tape, just to film at these locations, which probably also then contributed to the budget. However, by far, the most insane fact to demonstrate how difficult filming this attraction was is within the filming of the Anza Borrego Desert. It's the scene in the film with the horses riding in the sand. This location required Disney to enlist archaeologists to perform a paleontological... Paleontological? That's a hard word to say. Paleontological. Eh, you got it. You know what I'm trying to say. Uh, they had to do an assessment, uh, a paleontological assessment, in order to preserve any artifacts that may be harmed by the horses or the helicopter carrying the camera. In other words... Disney had to comb four fucking square miles of desert for artifacts before any cameras rolled. That is bananas. Remember that scene in Spaceballs when they're literally combing the desert? They had to do this for four square miles just so they could film in this in, in this little desert area. They really went the extra mile to just get the real thing as opposed to CG. You have to salute it. You have to salute well, it. Well, I'm glad we get an opportunity to appreciate it further than I could have ever imagined. Also, fun fact, those horses were uh, paid actors as well, plants. Those weren't wild horses. If that wasn't enough, the jets used in that sequence are so fast that in order to coordinate the helicopter in the air and the jets flying over for the shot, the helicopter took off a couple miles from the location, while the jets took off 200 miles away at the same time at Nellis Air Force Base Unreal. for them to meet on time <laughs> when the shot required. <laughs> It was basically this synchronized song and dance over hundreds of miles just because these jets are so fast. Also because it was dangerous because the jets would not be able to swerve out of the way if the helicopter was in the way and there would be just this massive crash. That does it for my fun facts. Let's move on to some current reputation for this ride. But before we do that, let's once again thank our sponsors. And we are back. Moving on to current reputation. Let's discuss how popular the attraction is today. What are the average wait times? Where does it fit in the current theme park landscape? What holes did this bad boy plug in? How do people generally feel about this attraction? Okay, as I had mentioned in the, the end of the history segment, this was, I guess, a big redemptive it well, was the crown jewel of California Adventure. It really was. It was it was the one piece in California Adventure when it opened in two thousand one that had that, you know, that magic. Yeah, um, yeah, that the rest of the park was lacking. That reputation has remained the same all the way till its closing. As a matter of fact, when it comes back for, you know, its seasonal appearance, yeah, it looks like there's actually an uptick in wait times. According to ThrillData.com, the California Adventure version of this ride, its all-time average wait time is 44 minutes. Can you guess the longest recorded wait time? Oh man, this ride does get quite the line. I'm gonna have to guess. Three hours. Nailed it. Nice. 180 minutes. Hell yeah. Can you guess what year this was? I'm going to guess 2022 when it was re-released. 2023. Oh, April cinnamon. 4th. That's really close though. April 4th of 2023. So when it was re-released. And by the way, this was commonly like an hour plus when it first opened. Even, even with California Adventure getting... 
mm-hmm. less than half the attendance of Disneyland on the other side of the Esplanade, this ride was still getting an hour plus wait. Well, I mean, that's also because it was one of the few rides that were A, operational and B, good. I couldn't get really good data in regards to Epcot's version. I, they didn't, they kind of bundle it all together for whatever reason. California Adventure is all able to get like a separate uh, yeah. average wait time. But I can say that for Soren over California, when they brought it back this year, according to an article posted by allears.net, there was a considerable uptick in wait times. That makes sense. And I was actually there in October and got to write it. For the first time in many years as Soren over California. And I can say when frequently checking the app, it was around an hour wait time where usually that scans. I went to Disney World in October of 2022 and I waited like half an hour. Oh my God. So, I just realized if you were going to Epcot when this ride opened as Soren over California, you were getting a twofer of Soren over California and living with the land in the same building. I can't think of a more relaxing tandem than that. That is amazing that's yeah. gummy town usa for me so to put it simply especially with current reputation like the land pavilion and its popularity they succeeded in what they were trying to do although i don't think nestle sponsors the land anymore that would be odd moving on to first impressions uh let's recount the first time we were on this ride and what initial effect it had on us okay so the first time i went on this ride i believe was in january of 2001 so this was during the annual pass preview days only annual pass holders were allowed during these specific days in january because the park i believe opened in february of that year yeah and i remember waiting a little over an hour for it i was with my entire family this was back when the land was called condor flats now it's just all considered grizzly peak and they made it more like woodsy yeah yeah um but back then it was like condor flats and it was an area of the park that was all dedicated to like aviation themed um, <laughs> and you know, it looks like a massive hangar outside. Still does. There was that Kinda. jet that's like blowing out mist. Yeah, I remember that. Out front. I don't know if that mist ever works anymore. If they even have, do they I have the jet? I, don't I, think, I, I think the jet's gone. Is it gone completely? Yeah. I think it's now I used like to, a watchtower. Wow. Yeah, I used to really enjoy that jet and blowing out mist, a especially on hot yeah. days. Yeah, but the I do remember the first impression of this ride. Of course, I had no idea. This is before I was like really doing research for all the rides. Yeah. At California Adventure, so I had no idea what I was in for. My first impression was not necessarily not necessarily a great one in regards to the queue because it is a very boring set of switchbacks. And this is where you really start to feel the budget cuts is in not necessarily the ride experience here, but in the queue. Like once you get inside, there's just like a long hallway that goes down to where like the stages split off. Yeah. But and they have like you know tributes to like aviators who kind of paved the way and yeah. like took aviation tech forward you know like the howard hughes and other you know iconic i'm not an aviation. it's like a museum and they call it the uh, the wings wings of fame yeah <laughs> but before you get into there which is like basically like the last 20 to 30 minutes of waiting you're in this this brutal set of switchbacks which luckily when i went on it it was january so it wasn't that hot outside but i can only imagine it being like a rough go yeah it's not for great. guests that opening summer it's also not great when you're in that like giant tunnel that basically like now it's like just a covid tunnel essentially uh that before you get to the concourses where yeah. you see yeah i mean at least it has high ceilings it does have unlike high like ceilings. space mountain which is like really claustrophobic that's true this line does not move fast i got to tell you it is well that's the thing is it does it in groups because once again it's like 87 passengers you move in big chunks but then you wait in big chunks. for long yeah. periods of time you know you win some um, you lose some. it's, it's a long attraction. Like, like you said it's like a over four minute experience four minutes 50 seconds. that combined with an equal amount of time i'd say for loading the passengers what did you feel when you first got on the ride when i first got on the ride itself well i guess the true experience really starts with the pre-show it is and that was like the first like very positive wave I was growing impatient by this point of the day. Mm -hmm. And at the time, I was obsessed with Emperor's New Groove. I saw it in theaters. I watched it plenty of times on VHS. As a matter of fact, (laughs) there was a point in my life where I had the entire film memorized. I admired it. I loved it. And I was obsessed with the character Kronk. And as soon as Patrick Warburton started saying those pre-show lines, I immediately was like, that's Kronk. Oh my God. This is the guy that plays Kronk. Yeah, I guess it would be weird to not know the actor and then to just be so familiar with the voice. And then it's the exact same voice because he doesn't put on a voice to be Kronk. He just 
talks like yeah. Patrick Warburton. I didn't even look it up to confirm. Like this is before the smartphone era or anything like that. I just knew a hundred percent. Oh my God, this is the guy that played Kronk. I do have memories of people behind me in line going, "Is that Kronk?" Like, <laughs> like you could hear yeah. it in like the in in the in the queue, which is really 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 fun. So immediately fell in love with this pre-show. It definitely upped my mood. Yeah, and got me pretty amped for the ride, and then. I mean, the experience was kind of a blur. I didn't know what to expect. Part of me was a little let down in terms of the motion of the ride. It wasn't extreme, extremely thrilling. Yeah. But I was also in awe of how unique it was. I remember getting swept away by the music. Mm -hmm. I think as a kid, I didn't appreciate the intimate nature of it, the uh, just kind of the delicacy of yeah. floating over California. There's like a stillness to it that mm -hmm. is probably not appreciated by kids. And I think what really helped with my experience of the ride was how much the parents enjoyed this attraction. My oh, yeah. mom being one of them. Oh, this ride this, is 1000% mom approved. It moms is love this ride. Biggest... You could go on TikTok and look at people having filming their moms, even on the new Soren. I, I remember at this point, I had been on a couple flight simulators or motion simulators, rather. I'd been on Star Tours, you know, uh, Back to the Future when it was uh, alive. Now the Simpsons ride. And I just remember thinking, this is the best simulator I've ever been on. I don't think I thought of it in that term because I was a child. But I was like, I love this. This is great. And I've always been like an anxious fellow. So like this ride was one of the few things that just kind of like brought me to center. And I just was chilled out. And, uh, and that was a combination of things. The music, I've always been affected by musical scores. And then also just the scent. And then uh, they do a good job of mimicking the motion with the screen, but also just the air blowing on your face and the mesh seats. I just remember being completely relaxed by this ride and almost mesmerized. And I remember my mom also loving this ride. In fact, my grandma loved this ride as well. This is just a family approved ride in general, but I, I find particularly with moms, they love it. They can't get enough of it. That does it for first impressions. Let's move on to the good and the bad. But before we do that, let's once again thank our sponsors. Moving on to good and the bad. What are the good and bad things about the ride? And we're just going to go through these one by one. We're going to start with the good. And this is just a little list I have here, as always. Top of the list I put already. Mom approved slash family approved. We already talked about it. Moms dig this shit. Number two, Patrick Warburton. He's just got a bullet point all to himself. I've said it before. I'll say it again. The greatest on-ride performance of all time. This guy has a voice given to us by the gods. Just, just silky smooth. Here's some of my favorite lines. And by some of them, it's pretty much the entire script. It's not a long script. But when the doors to your flight open, please take a seat and store all carry-on items in the underseat compartment. This includes cameras, purses, hats, and of course... These little beauties. And then they have this <laughs> great cutaway to this balding guy who has the Mickey ears on. He kind of gives him a look of like, I don't want to, but all right, I'll put them down here. Uh, always love that little cheeky moment. He takes his little Mickey hat he off. He takes his said. Mickey hat off. He's 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 having a good time, as we all are. Uh, next line is, <laughs> if smaller aviators don't measure up to the height indicator on the seat, just put the belt through the loop in the center strap before buckling. And then the iconic... Nice work, pal. Uh, nice work, pal. That actually is a shirt that I've seen people walk around. I thought they sold it in the gift store. They don't. And if they did, I would buy this shirt. And I guess these folks either made it or bought it off like Etsy or Redbubble or some shit like that. Uh, I'll have to look into that. And then the next line, soon you will be airborne. So if you or your little aviators have a fear of flying or heights, you might want to wait for your party at the arrival gate. <laughs> that bit gets you so amped, though, because it shows like the lights that are dark. When I would bring friends onto this ride for the first time, they'd be like, is this a simulator? And I'm like, yeah, it is. But you're still moving. And they'd be like, what do you mean? And, and, and in this pre-show video, at this moment when Patrick Warburton says this line, it does show the people getting into rows of seats and then them lifting off the ground which does make you kind of feel like, oh my God, are we actually going to fly over things in this ride? Now, I wonder if this production team or this film crew that did the pre-show for Soren, if they did other Disney attractions. It's like a stroke of genius. It is a perfectly produced pre-show video. Also, it's, it's excruciating 
to be sitting in this little like switchback like little pen they have you in when you're sitting in the concourses waiting to go into the actual theater because they have this animation of the Soren logo. I recall that when you are sitting here for a while, it is excruciating to just watch that logo spin around. Because it loops and it loops. loops and loops. And all you're doing is just like, dude, when am I going to see Patrick? I want to see Patrick. And the joy that you feel when this man walks out onto the screen with his funny little suit. Welcome to Soren over California. <laughs> Uh, and then the last line I do want to uh, review, and there's a couple reasons why I want to review this line, because, well, uh, let's just play it here. Okay, let's review. That is seat, seat belt, carry on item, safety strap, fear of heights, keep your hands and arms inside at all times, anything else. Yeah, have a nice flight. I love that part. It is so genuine. It's genuine, and the funniest part is that it is completely not genuine, because... <laughs> If you look at this, I tell everyone to look at this when they if, get on this Is it the right. actual script? There is a note that he's holding in his hand, kind of like as a prop to be like, all right, let me check my checklist here, blah, 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 blah. If you look at what he's actually holding, it is the fucking script for this VO. It's like in courier font and everything, it's in cur- right? It's in script format. Anybody who's ever written a, sc- a screenplay will recognize the, the, the blocking of the text on screen. It is literally the script that he is reading from and... It makes me laugh even more because this guy is so fucking nice with it that he didn't even memorize his lines. He's just reading from the page. He's doing a cold read, essentially to camera, and it flows and is now remembered as one of the coolest lines ever delivered on a ride. But he looks straight down the barrel for that have a nice exactly. He takes that pause. He's like, I've got this one in the noggin. Let's drop the script. That's how nice I am. That's how good I am about delivering these lines. My voice is so silky smooth. You're not going to even notice the fact that I'm blatantly reading from the script. Incredible. And to this day, every time I tell someone that, they're like, I have never noticed that before. That's just a testament to the performance. And then we have one more Patrick Warbird in line here, which is hap- it happens right before you take off. He says, soar into tower. We're ready for takeoff. So we're into tower. We are ready for takeoff. And then that sound effect. Oh right? my when, like, god! When like those little visors on the top of your ride vehicle like tilt they down. They tilt down, just mimicking the, kind of what it looks like to be in a hang glider. There's the lights an, get dark. It's got those blue dim like lights, and you just hear that. It's yeah. like the shit gets real so quick. It's this beautiful exhaust noise. It's like. And then you actually start to hear the beginning music cue of the Soren soundtrack by Jerry Goldsmith as this moment happens. All of this happens at the same time. And I have to, I'm not going to lie, it's up there in terms of moments on a ride where I get absolutely amped. Like, it is show fucking time when this happens, and I love it. And then the next good I wrote here, the score. Look, there will never, ever be a better on-ride score than this attraction i'm i'm willing to say that you can come at me and tell me any ones that deserve to be honorable mentions i can't think of one score that is more beautiful i've i've snowboarded to this soundtrack before it's incredible i'm yeah, shredding powder no, listening that, to that's the, a to green Jerry that's Goldsman. a green circle run oh dude sure. oh no dude oh yeah because you want to be just cruising you can't be yeah, like you're not through. carving through moguls no you're not you're you're just cruising on a green possibly running over some children as you listen to jerry goldsmith's mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Work them keys. Which you like to you like to snowboard in t- uh, Tahoe, which is one of the locations that they uh, it is in the they ride. Film in this ride. But I also listen to this when I'm driving on like a long drive, or if I'm going through a, per- a particular vista. Like there's certain stretches of uh, a drive over to even Vegas that are like kind of nice in in the desert, and you listen to this soundtrack, and it just improves everyone's mood. And it it is perfectly plays with the visuals. There are parts where it it, it amps up, like when you see the jets. There are parts where it gets real quiet, like when you see the sunset of the beach. There are parts where it kind of uplifts you, like when you see the the, the waterfall in Yosemite. It's it's poetry. And then you have the smells. I mean, I I know that there was a lot made about these smells, and like you know, it kind of seems goofy to be like we took some Glade and sprayed it in the air. Let's pat ourselves on the back. However, when paired with the score, when paired with the visuals and the wind blowing on your face. It is absolutely magical to be smelling the forest when you're looking at the redwoods and the canoes, or to smell the ocean when you're uh, riding over the tide, or to actually almost, it feels like 
maybe I'm the only one who who feels this. When we go to Yosemite and you see that waterfall, am I the only one who feels like you can actually feel the mist of the water blowing on your face? No, it I is, do. It is crazy. They really, they really sell that. I do think also, just to add to, like, in terms of smells, especially on this attraction. Well, there's one that reigns supreme. Oh, yeah. And that's, I'm sure we're going to bring that up. But just, like, the art form of producing these smells in terms of, like, theme parks at large, such an overlooked uh, art form. I really. I get the feeling that this is one of the few, uh, this is this isn't true probably, but it feels like this is the first attraction to really utilize smell in a meaningful way in an attraction. And speaking of meaningful way, everyone are obviously loves the oranges when you fly over those orange groves holy moly that citrus is perfect man. i i audibly hear people every time i got on this ride when the oranges happen there's usually like a ah <laughs> or people just goes wow do you smell oranges and it, it's obviously everyone smells the oranges and i don't even mind it because it's just like this communal experience we love seeing people shred in that sweet pow over in tahoe Salute you. I'm a fellow, a fellow powder hound myself, which I'm not talking about cocaine. I'm talking about uh, snowboarding. So you could you could shut it for all of you that are thinking that nasty. Uh, next thing I wrote here is Michael Eisner, Daman. Michael <laughs> Daman Eisner. It might be pronounced Damon, but I'm going to say Daman. Do you know there's actually a compilation on YouTube of just him saying hello? Every hello he's ever done. Hello. 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 Oh, yeah. I forgot about this part. There's a... This is my, one of my favorite parts of the score. There's a score switch. It happens when we're flying over the oranges. This is the first time it comes in, and also it takes place during the horse riding sequence, the sequence where they had to comb the desert. It switches into this kind of funky little acoustic Spanish guitar. Boom, boom, and you, you boom, boom. And you get a little maracas, like... <laughs> it like turns in like a Western mode. Yeah, it's so good. I love it so much. Jerry Goldsmith, you crazy for this one, Jay. It's insane. It's a, he really was going on. It's just got such a galloping vibe, like just like riding off into the sunset kind of thing. Jerry Goldsmith called for an ISO once again and just went to town, just went to work. And then we have some of the sites that I love seeing. Kobe's house. We see Staples Center before it was named Crypto.com Arena, maybe one of the worst decisions ever made by an organization. And then we have Walt's house, of course, Disneyland. You see Tinkerbell, could do without her, to be honest. She, I'll save that for the bad. You know, I'm going to write that in the bad. There you go. It's just, it's just, it's Which is one of my goods, by the way, is just how little CGI they did. Little CGI. The amount of work they put into getting like the real thing. Except with, for like, Michael Eisner's golf swing, which Michael I don't know. Eisner, I'm sure there's like a few, like for example, the hang glider is CG, which is actually pretty impressive because it looks pretty damn good. Oh, it's good. funny that you would mention that because that's also later. Oh, you piece of shit. Here we go. The here's, hang glider looks great. Here's Fuck another. You. Here's another good. What other ride could you say as the ride is ending is a good the descent from the screen the lights go to black after the fireworks it fades to black and then you just kind of fade back down and your ride just kind of just flies down it's a beautiful resolution and then patrick warburton comes over and i can't remember what he says it's something along the lines of like on behalf of our entire flight thanks for soaring over california it's just a beautiful moment and you kind of I think when you have a very peaceful, relaxing experience, the end always feels abrupt. Whereas in this particular case, it kind of just perfectly dovetails into you walking out the exit. It just kind of gradients away and you don't lose that feeling of being relaxed. It's an incredible feat. Yeah, it really it really like sends you off into the park very gracefully. Oh, God. And I will beautiful. add to your uh, showing Disneyland in the final scene with the fireworks show. It's really funny, especially in the opening years. And the impression I got was since this park, California Adventure, was so yeah. poorly received, it was really funny having this nugget at the end of the ride to basically be like, oh yeah, here's the better park. Yeah, incredible. That, that you're not at right now. <laughs> That's true. For those people who bought a one-day uh, ticket just to California Adventure, they got to see Disneyland to realize the folly of their ways. That's all my goods. Do you have any more goods, Byron? I know you just said a hang glider is one of them. I'm going to add the, uh, just the, the motion of the seats. You know, these seats don't bank. No. These ride vehicles just basically tilt, you know, 
forward and backwards. They or, do a know, little lateral they, they movement. They tilt you. That's that, that's about it. There's no lateral movement? I don't think there's any I think lateral there's, movement. I thought I read there was a little lateral movement uh, with just a tiny give because there's a mechanism in the It's right got to be so minuscule because I don't think that thing's banking. I hear that it doesn't bank huh, at all. If not, it's extremely minimal. And the, the sensation of banking is achieved with how well they shot that footage. Oh, the footage is incredible. And they obviously went to great lengths to capture the real footage in legitimate mm. locations and didn't CG it. The hard cuts really work with the score. The score is so well put together. Oh, yeah. That instead of doing transitions from scene to scene. Like they do in Soarin' Over the World. Yeah. They're able just to hard cut and it's completely fine. Or Soarin' Around the World. I keep saying Soarin' Over. I don't want people to be like, you know what? It's actually Soarin' Around. And I kind of love the idea of it just hitting you in the face with every new location. Oh, it's beautiful. It And it matches with the music. And I love when Disney... Well, like some of their attractions, another one that I'm sure we'll cover on this podcast, when they are able to like a half to three quarters of the way through the ride, just kind of settle you down again. Yeah. And give you that kind of like feeling of serenity. For example, like that sunset hour. And once again, that score just drops and says, do, 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 do. And you're just delicately like your toes feel like they're kissing the top of these, uh, these waves as the surfers like ride back to the beach at the oh, end of the beautiful. day. Oh, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Just that moment before they, they sweep you up into the final scenes. It's just the, the pacing of this ride is, is phenomenal. But it's time to move to the, to the bad. And there's not many, but I have a couple. Uh, one of them, it's not so much a bad. I just thought it was funny because I found out that those Yosemite climbers were hanging there for six hours. You barely see these guys. <laughs> they must have been so excited to get on this ride. Like, dude. I know for sure that we nailed it because we waited six hours to get. The, I don't know why they sound like this, but this is what they sound. Dude, we waited six hours fucking hanging there just to get this one shot. You all are you all in for a treat. Yeah. And then you see the movie. <laughs> I wonder if that's the same guy that ate shit off the Tahoe jump. Oh, yeah. That the guy skis. the guy beefing it. I'm sure he wanted another take. Can we get another take where I don't fall. And uh, they kept it in. You make me eat shit. I'm hanging there for six hours to show me for three seconds <laughs> on Yosemite. Oh, you're talking about the same guys that they just Yeah, reused. like imagine if it was the same. If, oh, I guess I could see a world stuff. in which they had the same dudes do the hanging, do the snowboarding, do the surfing. It just depends on like when the permits were allowed because I, I could see an easy company move between Tahoe and uh, Yosemite. That's not that far. Next bad I have here, the hang glider. What are we doing here? I, I, it's, it's a CGI hang glider. I think they're trying to make it like they, they wanted this hang glider here to demonstrate that you are supposed to be on a hang glider. But at no point in this ride am I really thinking like, oh, I'm enjoying hang gliding right now. I'm, I'm thinking like I'm enjoying flying. I don't need to see a hang glider in front of me. In fact, it actually takes me out of what, it. Do you every feel single like time. you're on a jet engine? It like... feels like I'm on a helicopter more so than a hang glider. Maybe it's because. We actually are on a helicopter. <laughs> no one's thinking like, what a great hang glide ride over Yosemite. Something that we definitely could do. I'm going to hang glide over the shoreline of a beach. Where did I jump off of? I think you're reading into it too much. I don't think I am. I always thought this was a shaky premise. They nailed everything except like they could have just been like, oh, you're going to helicopter. But then again, I guess you have to would have the you know the helicopter ambiance. I don't think you're traveling at the. I guess sometimes you are traveling. Hot at air balloon. Like the I'd buy a hot air balloon. Hang glider. I don't know, man. It just feels weird to I me. Mean, hot air balloon would be painfully slow. I'm I don't hang. Know. I'm hang gliding over Disneyland. Where did I jump from? Tower of Terror. Back when it was that. It just doesn't make any sense to me. There is a Wings of Fame exhibit in a hangar in this place showing all the famous aviators over time. And then they're like, all right, strap yourself into this hang glider. We just showed you planes for the last hour that you stood in line for. Makes no sense. Hmm. I just feel like... Which, by the way, the Disney World version differs in the sense that their queue is themed to like actually boarding on a plane and going to California. Yeah. See, that makes a little hmm. more sense to me. It I looks like a terminal. It's still boring as fuck. I could but... accept that. But the hang glider guy going as far to CGI a hang glider guy in... I could do without it. And it gets in the way of the beautiful view of the waterfall. I don't want to see your fucking... <laughs> I don't want to see your clenched ass cheeks hang gliding in front of me. I'd want to see the waterfall. And then the last one, I wrote, Tink, question mark, question mark, WTF. It, once again, this is a beautiful, just fly over attraction. You're so immersed. And then they add these goofy little things like the CGI hang glider guy or a, an animated, a fully animated Tinkerbell? 
I just don't know. It, it, it kind of takes away from the realism. And I realize it's kind of stupid to talk about realism when we're flying through a fireworks display on a hang glider. But uh, it just, I don't know. <laughs> Once again, takes me out of it. I don't and like it. She leads you and she zips into the castle, right? Like under, like through the gates of the castle. And all of a sudden, like these fireworks emerge. Exactly. It she, almost looks like she blew up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like we just saw Tinkerbell like, die. Follow me. Do you ever think about this when you're on this ride? Like. We're on a hang glider going through a fireworks display in the air. That's the last flight you're ever going to do, right? Like, there's no way you make it out of that alive. Sure. They won't even play that fireworks fireworks show when there's a slight breeze. They'll cancel it. Yeah. And here we are flying through it. So, I don't know. It's it's kind of goofy. I mean, how how would you envision the ending just, of this just, ride? I, I'm fine with the fireworks. I'm willing to look past that. You really do feel the... Uh, the booms of the fireworks too like the boom boom yeah those two initial pops are pretty sweet you feel it in the chest do you have any bads that you want to talk about I mean, just the queue just fucking sucks. The queue is terrible. I'm just going to keep adding on that. The queue is excruciating. The queue is boring. It's like clearly where the limitations came out in regards to building this ride. They went for it everywhere else. But yeah, clearly they cut some corners here. Yeah. And we could talk more about that in the world-class test, which we're going to get to right now. But before we do that, let's once again thank our sponsors. Okay, moving on to the world-class tests. This is a rubric of 10 tests painstakingly devised by Byron and myself to determine if an attraction is world-class. To receive the highly coveted world-class pass, the attraction must pass 7 out of 10 tests. A score of 6 out of 10 leaves the attraction up for debate for world-class pass standing. And anything lower than 6 out of 10 is an automatic fail. No world-class pass for you. Okay. Test number one, your stomach. <laughs> so this is the most my stomach's grumbled in my entire life. I'm fucking starving. <laughs> the, the test number one, the average tourist test. Would the average tourist have a hard time getting on this ride? Is there a long wait? Is there a complicated queue system? I mean, in the initial years, it always had a long wait. But I mean, it's hard to miss and it's still manageable. Oh, it's very manageable. Especially like considering the quality of this ride. 30, 40 minutes usually is where this bad boy is hovering when I see it. And even still, if you're lucky enough to have purchased Genie Plus and you have Lightning yeah. Lane. Then it's really easy. Then it's really easy getting on this bad boy. But oftentimes, especially since there are so many more e-tickets that are at California Adventure as well as at Epcot. Yeah. There's, I mean, there's plenty of times, especially no. in the morning where this is a 30 minute wait. You can make less. the argument that, that this is kind of like almost like a forgotten attraction for, by a lot of standards. Because at California Adventure, you have Radiator Springs, you have Guardians, Mission Breakout, you have Incredicoaster, much flashier toys. And in Epcot, you have Test Track, you have uh, obviously Cosmic Rewind, which fucking rules. You have the World Showcase. So you could see how this could kind of fall by the wayside in both of these parks. And I think it's fairly easy to get on these. Let's make a verdict here. I mean, obviously, this is a pass for me. Easy pass. Yeah, so an easy pass, one for one. Moving on to test number two, the Leslie Stahl test. Would you be willing to wait 60 minutes for this attraction if you've already been on this bad boy at least once? Soren a Tower. I'm waiting 60. <laughs> <laughs> I would wait 60. I would wait 60. I'm not going to lie. It's not an easy pass because I have seen this attraction attraction be around 30 to 40 minutes. I have been on this attraction, obviously, plenty of times. And having done so already, I still would wait the 60 for it if I really was feeling soaring. In fact, you could maybe have a little line beer or a little. Yeah, if you're doing that, I guess you could do that at Epcot, too. You, you could. Do... There's plenty of places to grab a beer and run in a line. But... Yeah. Or, you know, and just get yourself ready for this, this, this experience. Cause I feel like this is one of the, the few rides where you really need to be not, you don't need to be, but you can really, you know, amp yourself up for the, for getting relaxed. Yeah. Um, and, and as an adult, I'm starting to appreciate this ride more and more. So this is a pass for me. It's an easy pass. It's not an easy pass for me, but it is a pass. Two for two. The smartphone test, test number three. Does the queue of this ride have enough to keep you off of your phone? No, definitely not. I think this queue sucks. You know, it's funny because the Disney World version yeah. almost forces you to get on your phone. They they have like this Play Disney app trivia oh, game. Oh, yeah. It's one of those goofy While you're waiting, it's a massive projection games. that's on that hallway. And like, I thought it was fun for like 10 minutes or so, but... A, I'm using my smartphone, and B, it loses its appeal pretty quick. I'm like, all right, I'm tired of answering these trivia questions. And in the California version, it's kind of crazy to... 
talk about switchbacks. it. switchbacks. There's outdoor switchbacks, but it's kind of crazy to talk about a queue that has a themed hangar and it still sucks. Like, and he, it's interesting because early developers of like queue systems, yeah, like one of their golden rules was like, don't let guests visualize the weight. Whereas in Soren, it's just, you can see 100, 200 feet in front of you of like, I'm just in this, like once you get inside, uh, that's a long ass hallway. And then you turn left or right, depending on what stage you go to. And then it's like, oh wow, another long ass hallway. Yeah, all they're, they're really banking on you being interested in aviation history. Because it's just a straight line of a big group of people, and they have pictures of like Amelia Earhart, who was eaten by crabs. They don't put that in there, but she was. And they just like make you look at these pictures forever. And uh, it's it's excruciating. I think it's one of the worst cues in the entire resort, to be honest. In fact, I, I actually often make sure I do have a lightning lane just for that very reason. Or they have a single rider now, which is nice, just because this standby line is so excruciating. That being said, Still willing to wait the sixty. That's how good this attraction it is. It would be it would be so cool if they were able to kind of give it the like Mickey and Minnie treatment of making it look like an aviation like almost like if like Smithsonian. They tried like did like a museum. They tried of air, a, aviation, but it's not, it's not good. It's just like pictures like in small text that you have to squint. At. Yeah, it's pictures. It's on not a wall. like it would be neat if you were actually like weaving around certain they don't like, have the artifacts space. like no space. really give you that feel of like you know what like models of what like the Wright brothers were. Constructing stuff like that. They had the opportunity. They just didn't have the money. I think. I think time. that's what it comes down to. Uh, but fail. This is a fail. Fail. Two for three. Moving to test number four, the Tony Stark test. How innovative is this attraction? Does it push theme park tech forward? You know what? You don't have Soren. You don't have Flight of Passage. I would agree with that because Flight of Passage is the most advanced flight simulator or just motion simulator that I've ever. And it's been based on. on the ride system that was implemented here. And yeah, the ride system Which here, is completely original. It was made by Mr. Sumner himself using his, his family's erector set. You know, it's innovative in that sense. I think this is a pass. I think it's about as big a pass as you can give. There have been motion simulators in the past. Yeah, but they're not like this. They're not like they this. They had to find a air. creative way to give you that flight sensation. Also throwing you into a screen that must have been bigger than any screen at the time. Yeah. It pushed for things an attraction. It pushed things forward. For the sure. IMAX camera. Domed IMAX screen. A domed screen in yeah, general. It's I think it's just a pass in so many different ways. Three for four. Moving on to test number five, the Hollywood test. Can this attraction be adapted for the silver screen? Does it have a comprehensible story? <laughs> no. I mean, I, as much as I'd love to watch Patrick Warburton be a, a, a chief flight attendant for an hour and a half. Could you imagine if Patrick Warburton was a flight attendant, though? Like if he had never went into acting and he just was a flight attendant on a, like American Airlines and he was the guy that would be like, you want some pretzels? That would actually be a hilarious promo. It'd be incredible. If they did like one of those, like, you know how like, they have like famous people that like will like serve you your Wendy's meal or something like that? Or, yeah, yeah. If I had Patrick Warburton as like an honorary flight attendant like pop out like on a southwest flight or some some you know any sort of like flight and not expecting it i would lose my mind i would like i would let out the most high-pitched scream i'd pay first class i'd pay i, I don't I, I don't ever pay for first class but i would pay for a first class ticket if it came with patrick warburton but i think i well, this is undoubtedly a no pass for me so that is then three out of five that's a fail Moving on to test number six, the Simpson test. How likely is this ride to be replaced with something new? A la uh, Back to the Future being replaced by the Simpsons. <sighs> Look, I don't think it will ever be replaced at California Adventure. However, I am a little worried. They're talking about bringing Pandora over. And if they do bring Pandora over into one of the rumored locations, which is where Grizzly Peak is, that would replace... The red, the little, you know, uh, the, the adventure trail thing that's there. I think it's called like the, I can't remember what it's called, like Redwood Creek or something. And they would also probably replace Grizzly uh, River Rapids. I would like to hope. River Run, rather. I hope and I'd like to think that Disney has a good enough pulse, although miscalculated at times, they have a good enough pulse on their guests to know that they cannot replace Soren. Yeah, but it's a 60,000 square foot show building that and they can then use and convert into Flight I will of say Tower of Terror at the same park that opened in 2004 was greatly adored by park guests and they, and, got, and, and they put the Guardians on top of it. Ugh. 
I shit, man. I I'm surprised that I'm actually leaning towards failing this because I really could see a world in which they would repurpose that enormous show building. Well, well, well let's let's backtrack a second. We don't have Soren over California anymore. Oh, you're right. So I feel like it already failed. Yeah, but it failed in the sense that it was replaced by a version of itself. It wasn't like it rebranded to the Guardians. This was That's still true. Soren. That's true. They just it's upgraded the they upgraded the film. They still played this version of the ride every now and then, which yeah. means everything is in- essentially the same. Yeah. So, I think it's a pass. I'm giving it. I'm giving it the pass. Four out of six. It's a pass. They tried to kill it, and it still it st- it still comes back once in a while. That's because you can. Greatness may never die. Test number seven: the signature moment test. Can the ride hold its own without its signature moment? Is it a one trick pony? Is there a signature moment in this? I think it's an entire experience, and it's just every when the sum of its parts blend to evoke the feeling that it does. It's just hard to pick out one singular moment. More than any other ride we've covered, I can't think of a another attraction that feels more like a holistic just singular experience which is a good thing and not just like oh there's a clear peak here where it's the best and on top of it like what i think most people would consider the signature moment just the end with the fireworks some people would say it's the oranges the oranges could be a signature moment even like that first reveal like when you're floating up in complete darkness and all of a sudden you emerge above the clouds patrick warburton could be the signature moment <laughs> actually if there no. was no patrick warburton in maybe the it's new, our signature moment, i would be pretty but, pissed i would still get um, on it but i'd be pissed no this is and once again like when we like you go to the finale with the fireworks and stuff like that which i'm guessing would be most the most common vote of signature moment it works so well because everything was so good building to it. I think it's a pass. Definite pass, yeah. Five for seven. Moving on to the final three tests. But before we do that, let's once again thank our sponsors. And we're back. It's time to figure out if this is actually a world-class attraction. We have three tests to get it there. It only needs two. Let's go to test number eight. We're at five for seven. The premature detraculation test. Does this ride finish too soon? Absolutely not. Nope. It is perfectly paced. In fact, it is the perfect length. Just a proper three course meal. It's, it's of an attraction. Not too stuffed. Not yeah. too not too hungry. So many locations. So many variations of the score. It's beautiful. It's, that's another pass. That's six for eight. Moving on to test number nine, the exit hall test. Do you see people be physically excited getting off this ride? Do you have that bounce after this ride? I got to say, you got some great bounce after this. And you're getting grandma bounce. Like, I'm seeing grandmas, like... Yeah, it's like, not It's not like the again. kind of bounce you get off a roller coaster, but it is an energy, and like I like to define as bounce, is a special energy that's very unique that you can take into the rest of your day. You, you don't leave Soren over California without having positive vibes. No, I, that, I, I'm trying to think of another ride that you feel almost meditative. I can, like, deeply connect to the look of that exit hall, which is by theming standards, boring as all fuck. That's true. But I always remember walking back up to ground level through that long ramp. You're (laughs) surrounded by people that are just in the best fucking mood. They're in your euphoria. Especially when it's full of moms. Especially the moms that that have been on it the first time. Yeah. And I'll bring this up in another, in in, in the next Just to be clear, you're only in a euphoric mood when you're surrounded by moms. Yeah, you know. Just my type, right? <laughs> but but I do agree with you that I have very vivid Im- vivid imagery of this, you know, blue lit exit hall kind of area. And then you go out to California Adventure proper and you go up that little, the little hill, the little like ramp. It's beautiful. And you're just talking, most of the time I'm talking about how good I feel. The validation you get for how you feel is surrounded by you because you have 86 other people. It's the only thing I could compare it to is after I meditate, I feel just completely clear and peaceful. And that's exactly how I feel after this. And I can't think of one other attraction that makes me feel like I've just meditated for five minutes. Uh, It's incredible. Uh, So that's a pass. Seven out of nine. Look, folks, it's a world-class attraction. I don't think anybody had any doubt for this one. But uh, No no brainer. But let's see if we can pad those stats, yeah? Moving it to number 10. The fine wine test. Has this ride aged well? Has your opinion of the attraction appreciated or depreciated since your first experience? Or if it's a new ride, do you believe it will age well? Now, this is a tricky question because by definition, because they changed it into Soarin' Around the World, 
I think that's a clear depreciation. However, but we're not reviewing soaring around the world. We're reviewing we're warning soaring over California. And the ride soaring over California has done nothing but age beautifully in my mind. In fact, I long for it. I will go to the park specifically for when they bring this ride back, which they do. And they recognize that. It's a draw. It's a literal draw to get people to get to the park because they are bringing the ride back. And I'll, I'll summarize my feelings about this test with Soren over California and this, with this anecdote. I had not been on Soren over California since it closed in 2016. Oh, wow. I had not made it to the seasonal reappearances. So for the past, what, five to seven years or so, yeah, I've been experiencing Soren around the world. And for the first time since 2016, I was able to revisit Soren over California just around the time that I was actually visiting Disney World. A shout out to Kevin Perger at Defunct Land, by the way, by bringing that to our attention before we were recording the Space Mountain episode. So I made it a point to go to Soren over California when they're doing the temporary release of it there. Yeah. I did wait 45 minutes in line. We get on the ride and we are sitting next to these two, uh, these two women in probably at least their 70s amazing and i don't know if they're really good friends or cousins or you know sisters yeah but they appeared very close it was very obvious from their body language and the way they were kind of like stumbling in there trying to you know abide by patrick warburton's rules yeah um that this was the first time that they had been on the ride of course during the ride experience revisiting all these scenes the music everything i almost cried <laughs> <laughs> i could see myself doing that as well um like my girlfriend and i were just like just fell in love with it all over again like i really felt the contrast of soaring around the world by revisiting it because yeah. i didn't watch any footage of this ride in years i didn't like yeah, yeah so like i was i really felt like i was just almost like the closest thing you could get to riding it for the first time again that's amazing and when we floated back down to the bottom, like I really had like no words besides like just internally feeling like, holy crap, I didn't realize how much I missed this ride Yeah, in this form as soaring over California. Um, just that intimate feel that it just is not emulated and soaring around the world. And over to my right, the two old women sitting next to me, one leans over to the other and goes, you know? That was fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> and that pretty much echoes throughout anyone that experiences this ride for the first time. I got to relive that and my appreciation for the ride since revisiting it this year for the first time in years just skyrocketed. Yeah. So this is one of the biggest passes I've ever given on a ride. Yeah, I have to say that I'm just right there. And I mean, and Disney proved it. Like it, it is so, it is aged so well that they recognized, oh shit, we have to bring this version of the ride back every now and then to keep people happy because like imagine spending the amount of money that they did on Soarin' Around the World, which I believe is over a hundred million. And, <laughs> and then recognizing like we put an enormous investment in this new version of the ride however people love the old version so much that we recognize we have to bring it back every now and then which is i think further validates us passing it on the simpsons test because they basically did a reverse simpsons how often have you had a ride so beloved that after they take it away to bring it back and i will go as far as to say and this is a, a prediction that is probably not shared amongst the majority of Disney Park fans, I think we will actually get a permanent rendition of Soarin' Over California brought back to Disney California Adventure. I'd love for you to be right. I don't think you're right, but I'd love for that to be right. It might be wishful thinking because there's plenty of other Soarin' Around the Worlds. So you got it yeah. in Shanghai. Yeah. yeah. It opened with that park. You got it with uh, Fantastic Flights, like a, a world version that is in a way, like at least with a pre-show and it's yeah. theming before the flight takes place. And I think with specific show scenes, at Disney Sea. Yeah. So it's got a unique nature there. And then Epcot, if it remained as Soaring around the world. Around the world, and then it's 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 exclusive stateside in that sense. It also makes sense in the park of and, Epcot because that's a world place. There's a world showcase that makes sense mm -hmm. that it would be there. And it makes sense to be permanent at California Adventure. Oh, it, it's just a it's a perfect fit. It was the best like shining beacon of what California Adventure was when it first opened. So why not leave a little remnant of 
their opening, you know, as an opening day attraction. At least have something. I guess I haven't thought about it that way. You have made a good point. It would be in their best interest to make it permanent. How many other opening day attractions do they have at California Adventure? I don't know. Either way, that's a world-class pass for this attraction. Uh, Eight out of ten. Congratulations. (laughs) Congratulations. But uh, uh, thank you all for listening to this episode of For Your Amusement. Or if you're watching this, thank you for watching on YouTube. Make sure you subscribe. And make sure if you're listening to subscribe and to also rate this bad boy five stars so we can continue to make this podcast because that does help quite a bit. Make sure you follow at FYA pod on all the socials. I'm at Ryan Bergara on Instagram, at Ryan S. Bergara on Twitter. And Byron is at Byron A. Marin on all the aforementioned socials. But for now, soaring over California. Nice work, pal. (laughs) Very good.